All right, so this is, we're solving May, June, 2016, paper 21. May, June, 2016, paper 21. Okay, all right. Question number one, complete the table below to show the composition and identity of some atoms and ions. All right, first one we have is lithium. Atomic number is three, right? So then can someone tell me what would be the number of protons here? Jaldi, jaldi. Time needs to. Number of protons kya honge? Teen honge. Number of neutrons kya honge? Nucleon number is six. Teen honge. Sahi hai. Because protons plus neutrons is nucleon number. And what's the number of electrons? It has an overall charge of plus one. So it's lost an electron. So it has two electrons. Good. All right. Oxygen. Oxygen ka proton number kisi ko yaad hai? Kya hota hai? Eight. Okay. And you can look at the periodic table if you don't remember. So it has atomic number eight and proton number eight. So what's the nucleon number? It has nine neutrons and eight protons. So that's 17. And then what's the overall charge? It has 10 electrons. It has eight protons and 10 electrons. So the overall charge is minus two. There we go. Next guy, atomic number 26. Ye kisi ko agar yaad hai to inaam milega. Inaam mera approval hai obviously. So yes, yes, it is iron. Iron is proton number 26. Here, see? So what we have is over here, we have ion. Name, like, so please don't write the symbol, write the name. Iska neutron number, kya hai? atomic number 26, nucleon number 54. So what's the neutron number? 54 minus 26 is 28. And what's the overall charge? It has 24 electrons and 26 protons. So it's plus two. Okay, and then the last one we have is atomic number 17 or proton number 17. This is proton number 17. 17 is chlorine, correct? Right here, chlorine. So we go back and we say, you know what? We got chlorine over here. Nucleon number is 17 protons, 18 neutrons, so that's 35. And number of electrons is the same as protons because it's neutral. Its charge is zero. So same protons and electrons. Beams of protons, neutrons, and electrons behave differently in the same electric field, right? So they've shown us the electron beam. So then what's the positive terminal? What's the negative terminal? If I was to ask you the plates ke charges, which plate is positive? Niche wali ke upar wali. Which is the positive plate? Down, right? So this is the positive plate. This is the negative plate. So then what happens to a neutron through a field? What happens to the neutron through the field? Can we say that the neutron remains undeflected? It passes straight through because it doesn't have a charge. And what about the proton? It goes towards up, yes. But does it deflect more or less than the electron or the same? Deflected more, Sharyat? Deflected less, it's heavier, isn't it? Protons. Like that. There we go. So here we have added and labeled the lines to the photon. Okay, and you have to clearly show that it deflects lesser than an electron beam. Okay. So let's even let's if you want to be even more particular, you can do it very, very visibly like this. Next question. The fifth to eighth ionization energies of three elements in the third period are given. The symbols used for reference are not the actual symbols of the elements. State and explain the group number of element Y. 
Yes, seven good marks. So element Y, you are saying it is group 15. Why are you saying it's group 15? Look at the big jump. Where is the big jump in element Y? It is from the sixth to the seventh. What does that tell you? That the seventh electron is in an outer, in an inner shell. The seventh electron is in an inner shell. So the outer electrons are, the first six are in the outer shell. The first six are in the outer shell. So we can say, X yes, element Y. So group 16. And what is the explanation for this? There is a big, big increase or a big jump from sixth to seventh ionization energy. Hence, Y has six outer electrons because the seventh one must be on the inside. Okay. Ionization energy, sorry. State and explain the general trend, the general trend in first ionization energies across a period. What's the general trend? The general trend is that it increases, right? So you have to first state the trend. One mark for just stating the trend. So ionization energies generally increase across a the period. There are exceptions, you know that, across a period. Okay. Why do they generally increase across a period? Same shells, yes, and number of nuclear charge increases, absolutely. Right? So, because the nuclear charge increases, whereas the number of shells and shielding from inner electrons, right? Or repulsion from inner electrons remain the same. Hence, outer electrons experience more attraction from the nucleus. Sometimes the same question will be for three marks, so you'll have to mention the more attraction part. So it's just better to say, it's just better to give the full three mark explanation, attraction from the nucleus. You'll have more than enough time, inshallah. All right. Explain why the first ionization energy of element Y is less than that of element X. So element Y is group 16. Element Y is group 16. And element X is group 15. Right? Because we have a big jump from the fifth to the sixth. Now, why is there a dip in the trend? Group 15 period three make out there. Group 15 period three is this is phosphorus and this is sulfur. So why is there a dip from phosphorus to sulfur? Anyone remember? Let's go back for a second. They're saying period three may group 15 to 16 may dip kyun aate? If you guys remember, phosphorus was P3 and sulfur was P4, right? So we can say that Y, which is sulfur, Y, which is sulfur, has a pair has paired electrons in one of the 3p orbitals. Orbitals, okay? This electron is easier to remove. Easier to remove as it experiences Mutual repulsion, right? Or you can say this electron is easy to remove. A simple, simple way to say it is due to electron-electron repulsion or mutual repulsion of electrons. They're the same thing, guys. If you say mutual repulsion of electrons or you just say electron-electron repulsion. Okay, same thing. 
same thing interelectronic repulsion yes that's also fine all right complete the electronic configuration of element z element z consists me element z it's in the third period it's in the third period and it is in group 17 so agar group 17 mein, it ends with what it must be group 17 period 3 is chlorine the electronic configuration of chlorine ends with 3p5 3p5 right fifth column of the p block so over here we go back and we say 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p5 there we go a sample of oh, a sample of strontium exists as a mixture of four isotopes information about three of these isotopes is given in the table calculate the abundance of the fourth isotope how do we calculate the abundance of the fourth isotope we don't know the fourth isotope we need to calculate its abundance if they've given you they're saying there's a total of four isotopes so on char isotopes ki abundance adds up to a hundred right so let's call this x percent so we can say x plus 9.86 plus 7 plus 82.58 is equal to 100. So what does the x key value come out to over here? Zero point five six percent So that's the abundance. The relative atomic mass of the sample of strontium is 87.71. Calculate the mass number of the fourth isotope. How do we calculate the mass number here? Well, can I say that out of 100 of a total, we have a total of 100. The average mass is obviously the relative atomic mass. So 9.86 out of 100 have a mass of 86. Seven of them have a mass of 87. 82.58 have a mass of 88. And then the remaining 0 0.56 have a mass of n. That's what we have to calculate. Right? So let's say n. is a different variable. And this is equal to the relative atomic mass. The average mass of these 100 isotopes, if you divide by 100, the average mass is equal to the relative atomic mass. So then what do we get? For m. We get 0 0.56 m is equal to 8771 minus 9.86 times 86 minus 7 times 87 minus 82.58 times 88. So you get 0.56 m is equal to 47. So what does m come out to? 47 divided by 0 0.56. 47 divided by 0 0.56. 83.9, yes. Now, but they are saying you have a mass number. So what would the mass number be? It wouldn't be 83.9. What would the mass number be? A mass number has to be what? They're not asking for the isotopic mass, right? Isotopic mass to decimals, it's an experimentally determined mass. But what about the mass number? The mass number is an integer. So you round it off to what? It would be 84. Okay, and please write 84. 83.9, you lose marks. Because mass number means that it's an integer. All right, a whole number. Right? Value. So 84 is the answer here. All right, question number two. D, E, F, and G are four consecutive elements in the fourth period of the periodic table. The letters are not actual symbols. D is a soft silvery metal with a melting point just above room temperature. Okay. It's amphoteric oxide. It's amphoteric oxide has a melting point of 1900 degrees Celsius. So 
Okay. On the other hand, G is a solid that can exist in several different allotropes, most of which contain G8 molecules. G burns in air to form GO2, which dissolves to form an acidic solution. This solution reacts with sodium hydroxide to form the salt Na2GO3. Now, my question is this. What is D most similar to? Which period three element is D most similar to? So D is most similar to aluminum. So it must be in the same group as aluminum, but it's in the fourth period. Aluminum is in the third period. So G must be gallium. Someone already answered that, I believe. Right? Vishal, yes. So gallium for this, good. So D is gallium. And what about S? Or oh, what about G, sorry? G is most similar to what? G8 molecules. G is similar to sulfur, right? So if you look at sulfur, see period mein hamare paas kya hai? Selenium. See period mein hamare paas kya hai? Selenium. Right, as Vishal mentioned. So what we have here is G is selenium. You can also write the state, uh, the symbols, if you want, S-E, okay? So selenium and, selenium and gallium. Write equations for the reactions of D2O3 with hydrochloric acid. So it's an amphoteric oxide. Amphoteric mean it reacts with acids and bases, so it will neutralize the acid, right? So can I say we have D2O3, okay, plus HCl to form the salt, which is DCl3 plus H2O, right? And if you had to balance this equation, if you had to balance this equation, how would you do it? Well, let's balance it. We have two Ds. So what we have is two DCl3. So we're going to need six HCl and therefore three H2. That is balanced. Yes, one, six, two, three. Good. What about sodium hydroxide? Does anyone remember what aluminum oxide formed with sodium hydroxide? Does anyone remember the salt? I taught you guys this. ALOH4 minus Na plus. Yes, salt banti hai, right? Yaad hai kisi ko period 3 mein se? Kenei yaad. Ji. To yahaan par, aap jab D2O3 ko react karenge, NaOH ke saath, you will simply form D, Sorry, not D, sorry, Na plus Na, Al, Na, sorry, Na, D, Al, D, OH4. So we have the DOH4 minus ion. It's a complex ion right here. Okay. So now, so this is the answer. So we have to balance this equation. So how many hydroxides do we have? What's missing over here? What's missing over here? Something else is also reactant may H2O be okay. Yes. So this is our equation. Okay, this is our equation. And if we balance this, you will realize that we need how many of each? That you're going to have two of these guys, since you have two of these. Right, and then since you have this, two of this, you're going to need two NaOH, and then the rest of the hydrogens will come from water. Like that. We need two sodiums and two Ds over here. Right. So then we have two hydrogens here, eight over here. So then we have six more. Okay. Suggest the type of bonding and structure in D2O3. It has a very high melting point of 19 degrees, 1900. So aluminum oxide, what is bonding? Hoti thi? So it must be a what type bonding and structure. So it's a giant 
ionic lattice right or a giant ionic structure write an equation for the formation of an acidic solution when GO2 dissolves in water. This one's simple. Sulfur dioxide, just said, GO2 reacts with water to form H2GO3. If you guys remember, sulfur dioxide, kya banata tha? Sulfite ion. It's the same idea. Okay. Same idea here. Because G, humne dekha tha, group 16 mein, selenium mein. Okay. There we go. The elements in group two and their compounds show many similarities and trends in their properties. Magnesium, calcium, strontium, and barium all react with cold water. Describe what you would see, sorry, describe what you would see when calcium is added to cold water. Al2O3 is giant ionic, yes. So it's an ionic compound, right? 1900 degrees Celsius ka melting point. The only, the only covalent structure oxide and uh, the only giant covalent structure that you have is silicon dioxide. Okay, in period three oxides. In period three oxides, the only giant structure, covalent structure you have is silicon oxide. So it must be either covalent, <clears throat> so it has to be ionic. Okay. All right. So what would you see when calcium was added to cold water? What would you observe when calcium was added to cold water? <clears throat> Anyone remember the reaction of calcium with water? What do we produce? Calcium with pani kya produce karta hai? Ko yaad hai? Calcium hydroxide and what? And Hydrogen gas. Do you guys remember this? It's not balanced. We can balance it also if you would like. We have two of this and that's balanced. Right? So then, so this is the equation. We have actually, actually already done the second part right here. This is the equation. Okay, now. So what would you see over here? What are the few things that you would see? Well, one thing you would see for sure is, one thing you would see is what would happen to the calcium, the silver metal, right? So yes, so one thing you would see is that the silvery metal starts dissolving, gets smaller, right, and dissolves. That's one thing. The other thing you would see is bubbles of a colorless gas because of hydrogen gas forming. And calcium hydroxide is considered partially soluble. So you, as, as Mohammed mentioned, you also see a water would turn cloudy, right? So a cloudy solution would form. Cloudy solution would form. Or milky solution, right? White PPT of calcium hydroxide, basically. Okay, it's suspended in the solution. That's why it appears cloudy. All right. Describe how the reaction of barium with cold water would differ from the reaction. How would the reaction with barium differ? First of all, would it happen faster or slower? It would be more vigorous, right? So if you were to observe it, what would you observe? You'd see faster, you'd see faster bubbling of gas, right? faster bubbling of gas, right? You can also say that the metal would dissolve faster or would disappear faster. 
What's another observation that you would see with barium? Would barium hydroxide form as cloudy a solution? No, right? Barium hydroxide is more soluble. So you would also see a clear solution. Any one of these three differences would be fine. Okay, there's three, like it's a one mark thing. So you can write any of them. So clear solution since barium hydroxide is more soluble. Okay, so clear solution forms. All right, magnesium oxide can be formed by the reaction of magnesium and oxygen in air. Draw a fully labeled reaction pathway diagram for this reaction. Now, my first question is this. Reaction pathway is an energy profile diagram. So what we have is our reactants right here. Our reactants are magnesium and oxygen. And our product is magnesium oxide. Now, my question is this. Is magnesium, is this an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? Would this be an exothermic? It's, a, it's an exothermic reaction, right? It releases heat. And it's a combustion reaction. So you should know that it's going to be exothermic. So our product is lower in energy. Our product is lower in energy, like that. So what we have is we're going to need energy to activate the reaction. And then we're going to have a, and then we're going to have this sort of a reaction. There we go. If you had to label this, we have to label this reaction. So let's label it. Right, this is our delta H. And this is our activation energy. So that's your fully labeled reaction pathway diagram. Okay. Explain why there is no visible reaction when a piece of magnesium is just exposed to the air. So why don't they have, why don't we have any reaction if if magnesium is lying around in air? Why do I need to provide a spark? Yes, activation energy is needed, right? So, so we can say that activation energy is high, hence heat has to be provided. Okay, hence, hence heat has to be provided. Okay. And you have to explain this so you can say that there are very few particles or no particles, no particles with energy, with energy greater than or equal to the activation energy, right? So for a reaction to take place, particles have to have energy that's greater than or equal to the activation energy. So we're saying that by Heat may agar jab tak aap heat ni provide karoge jab tak aapke paas particles don't have enough energy. Okay. Technically, there's it's never no particle, it's actually very few. There are very few particles because there are always going to be some particles that have very high energy, but it's a very negligible amount. So the reaction doesn't take place. Okay? So it's very few particles. That would be a, Cambridge will accept no particles, but a more precise answer would be very few particles. Okay. Magnesium oxide is used to manufacture heat resistant bricks for furnace linings used in the steel making industry. State and explain the property of magnesium oxide that makes it suitable for this. So why is it suitable for this? For furnace linings. What property? State the property. What property is that? Look at the keyword state and explain. So it has a very high melting point. It has a high melting point. And why does it have a high melting point? Because, because of strong electrostatic forces of attraction or strong ionic bonds, right? Electrostatic forces of attraction. Okay. 
between cations and anions or oppositely charged ions okay so this is this is called ionic bonding obviously in this question again it's since, since it's only two marks they'll just accept strong ionic bonding but if it was three marks then you'd have to say strong forces of attraction between cations and anions so it's just better to stick with the full explanation okay so just a reason why magnesium oxide cannot be used as a lining for any furnaces containing acidic materials. So why can't I use magnesium oxide whenever acid is present? Why can't I use magnesium oxide when acid is present? Because MgO is basic, right? And will react or neutralize the acid. Will react with the acid. The nitrates and carbonates of the group two elements from magnesium to barium decompose when heated. State the trend in the temperature of thermal decomposition. So what happens to the thermal stability or temperature? Or how, how much temperature? As I, as I go down the group, do I need more temperature or less temperature? I need to increase the temperature, right? Of thermal decomposition because they're more stable down the group. So I can say that you just have to state the trend. So it just increases. Just have to state it. Increases. Okay. Give the equation for the thermal decomposition of magnesium carbonate. This is straightforward, right? Magnesium carbonate. Okay. Decomposes to form magnesium oxide plus carbon dioxide. Give the equation for thermal decomposition of calcium nitrate. And the explanation for thermal stability is not an AS. No, that's an A2. Why is it more thermally stable? That's part of A2. Okay. The polarization and all that. Yeah. Calcium nitrate ki decomposition mein kya hota hai? You form calcium oxide. You have two nitrogens, so you're going to form two NO2 and you're going to form half O2. Uh, this, is, this is the question why I chose this guy. This is the question why I chose this paper. This question is about molecules with the molecular formula C4H8. Give the structures of a pair of positional isomers with the formula C4H8. Okay, so C4H8 generally kis tarah ke hydrocarbons ka hota hai? C4H8 kis tarah ke hydrocarbons ka hota hai? Alkenes. So when we're talking about positional isomers, what group is changing in position? What group is changing in position? The double bond, right? Double bond. Yes, alkenes are cyclic alkenes. But if positional isomers, they have to be alkenes, right? Because the functional group present in you know? So if they're positional isomers, they have to be alkenes. Now, positional isomers, mein kya hai paas? Misal ke pe, we could have a possibility like this. Right? Ye carbon number one pe hai, double bond. So the other possibility mein carbon pe hoga? Carbon number two. Right. Give the structures of a pair of chain isomers, a pair of chain isomers with the formula C4H8 that do not exhibit stereoisomerism. So both of them don't exhibit stereoisomerism. So let's just draw the first one that we have here, CH3. Sorry, I'm going to let it come. This is CH3. So now in the second one, we can again draw the first one just as we did. Because it doesn't show stereoisomerism. Ab iska agar chain isomer hoga, two methyl groups. So, for example, what if I had something like this? Two methyl groups here and then two H2s over here. That's four carbons, isn't it? That's four carbons, isn't it? So can I say that's a possibility? 
It doesn't show cis trans isomerism. Both the carbons on the double bond are bonded to two identical groups. So we have a three carbon chain as someone mentioned, and we have a branched methyl group, right? So these are chain isomers. Agreed everyone? Carbon number one position, same as dono ki uh, double bond ki, lekin ek mein branch hai, dusre mein nahi hai. Okay. Give the structures and full names of a pair of stereo isomers with the formula C4H8. So tell me, which of these alkenes that I've drawn actually shows cis trans isomers? Which of these alkenes that I've drawn shows cis trans isomerism? Butuene, right? Butuene, right? Exactly. So we can say that butuene may we have either this guy and make sure you show it clearly. transit. We have either this. Ye kaun sa isomer maine banaya yahan par? Butuene mein. This is cis butuene. And then we also have trans butuene. We also have trans butuene. For this, you have to clearly show the isomers, the cis and trans nature of them. So we have trans doing. You have to give the names as well. All right. The structure of a molecule A of formula C4H8 is shown. Draw a functional group isomer of molecule A in box B. Explain how molecules A and B could be distinguished by a chemical test. So if functional group isomer is a cycloalkane, so what functional group could any alkene, right? Any alkene would work. So again, we can just use the same one that we used throughout. CH2, double bond CH, CH2, CH3, four carbon alkene. These are both C4H8. What's the chemical test I can use to distinguish between the two? Aqueous bromine, right? Or bromine water, aqueous bromine. That is bromine water. Okay, so aqueous bromine. Okay, would be decolorized by, would be decolorized by B, but not by A. Okay, there we go. All right. Question number seven, uh, number five, sorry. So we're done with uh, the question four, the question five. A reaction sequence is shown. First reaction, we have bromoethane reacting to form propane nitride. What are the, uh, so I'm going to ask you reagents and conditions for each. How do we convert a Bromine to a nitrile, halogenoalkane to a nitrile. What can re reagents and conditions do we need? Anybody remember for reaction one? Does anybody remember? Let's do a quick revision here. No, not HCN and NACN. That's for nucleophilic addition. We use NACN or KCN and ethanol. Chariot, HCN, tabi aata jab aap HCN add karna chaaro. So, halogen, carbonyl compounds matter, addition of HCN. Okay, otherwise, you just use NACN or KCN and ethanol. HCN is used only for addition. So, NACN or KCN and ethanol and heat under reflux. I'll just write HUR, heat under reflux. What about reaction two? Converting a nitrile to an acid. Converting a nitrile to an acid. What do Dilute acid and heat under reflux. So you can use HCl. It can also be alkaline hydrolysis. Scalar, you'll just use NaOH. Reaction three may, well, they've given us the reagent. We're reducing propanoic acid. Okay. What about reactions four and five? Reaction four may kya hai pas? Reaction four me kya hai pas. Converting this to an alcohol. NaOH, but in what conditions? NaOH what? 
aqueous, right? And heat under reflux. And what about elimination? Elimination ke liye kya use karte hai? NaOH and ethanol. And heat under reflux. Good. So now we now that we've quickly revised this. Complete the diagram to show the mechanism of reaction one. Include all necessary charges, partial charges, lone pairs, and curly arrows. So what type of a mechanism is this? Anyone remember? What type of a mechanism is this? What's the name of the mechanism? Nucleophilic addition, eh? Hmm? Aniva? Hello? Substitution? Hello? Yes. Thank you. Substitution, eh? Na? BR is being replaced by CN. It's a saturated compound. It can't do addition. Why you say this? Why? It's a metaphorical statement, but you know what I mean. So here we have, here we have delta plus carbon, delta minus dopamine, this bond heterolytic fission. So what type of substitution is this? Does anyone remember? It happens in a single step. Happens in a single step. So it must be which one? Yes, haha, but the hair. Ah, Maniva, kya ho gaye? Aap bata, chal. Kaun si nucleophilic substitution hai? SN1, K2. One step mechanism. SN2, right? SN2. Good. And then bromide ions are released. Over here. Give the name of the type of reaction involved in reaction three. Reaction three, what's the type of reaction when we're convert when we're reacting lithium aluminum hydride with propanoic acid? What reaction is that? It's a reduction reaction. It's a reduction reaction. Okay. All right. The infrared spectrum of propanoic acid produced by reaction two is shown. Describe the main difference between the infrared spectrum of W and that of propanoic acid. So can someone tell me what would W be? Propanoic acid, if I reduce it, what will I make? Propanoic acid, if I reduce it, what will I make? Primary alcohol, right? So it will be which alcohol over here? Propan. One all. Right? This is the group that I'm reducing. It becomes a primary alcohol. Okay. So what's the main difference between the two? The main difference. Ek to bada difference kis konsi peak ka CO2H na, but remember the difference has to be told in terms of bonds. So what's the what bonds are different in? What bonds are different in acid than they are in the primary alcohol, right? So the first thing is, the first thing is that, first thing is that the peak at 1600 and let's look at the data booklet. C double bond O jo hai, C double bond O jo hai, uski kya peak hai? Yera likha hai, 16, Approximately 1670 to 1740, somewhere in this range. So the peak at approximately 1700 wave numbers, right, due to C double bond O will disappear, will not be present in W, right, it disappears. It disappears when W is formed. If, if you if you check for W, it won't be present. All right. What other thing? Someone just mentioned broad peak, right? So you will also say that very broad peak, very broad OH peak from acid, right? Around 2,500 to 3,000 wave numbers disappears but will we have a new oh peak will we have a new oh peak and oh peak at 
3200 3, to 3600 wave numbers is observed. So we do have a new OH peak, it's just not the same one as the old one. Okay, in W. All right, so that's the answer. Re reactions four and five use the same reagent. Give the reagent and condition needed for reaction four. We already noted this down. Reaction four was NaOH aqueous and heat under reflux. So the reagent that we use, the reagent that we use is uses potassium or sodium hydroxide. Right, and the conditions are aqueous and heat under reflux. Okay, so we'll actually, I actually like to write down aqueous over there as well. So we have, sorry, okay, NaOH aqueous. Okay, so aqueous and heat under reflux. And the second part is for reaction five. It's NaOH again, but the conditions are, we are gonna do it in ethanol. We're going to do it in ethanol. In ethanol and heat under reflux. Okay. Now. Use appropriate, under appropriate conditions, Ethanol and propanoic acid undergo a condensation reaction. So what type of a reaction is this? When ethanol and propanoic acid react, reagent should be just NaOH. Yeah, you can say just NaOH as well. Well, I just wrote it down in both places, right? It's okay either way. So yeah, if you just write down NaOH, then you just say aqueous and heat under reflux. It doesn't matter if you say aqueous upper or niche, but that's the idea. Okay. That's the idea. I mean, because technically aqueous solvent is a reagent. You can think of it as a condition or a reagent. Does that make sense? So that's why I've just written down the full thing for both. All right. Under appropriate ethanol and propanoic acid undergo condensation. So that's esterification, right? So what's the conditions that we need for this reaction? Essential, necessary for this reaction. We're going to use concentrated, concentrated sulfuric acid. Okay. All right, as a catalyst, draw the skeletal formula of the compound. So we have ethanol, CH3, CH2, OH, right? And we have an acid, which is propanoic acid. So what happens here? Well, the alcohol, if you remember, loses the H because the oxygen from the alcohol bonds over here, right? So what we have is the alcohol loses the H and the acid loses the OH, right? So then if we remove the H and the OH, what do we left with? We remove the H and the OH, we're left with this. Okay, buddy, so you made a struggle. Mm. So we're left with this structure. This is our ester, right? This is our ester linkage. So if you had to draw the skeletal formula, we have to draw the skeletal formula. What do we have? We have, let's, let's number these, right? One, we have a total of five. So one, two, right? One, two. And then if we're looking left to right, this carbon is bonded to an oxygen. This carbon is bonded to an oxygen, right? And then that's bonded to another carbon, bonded to another carbon that's bonded to a C double bond O, and that's bonded to two more carbons. So that's your structure. If you wanna count, you can one, two, three, four, five carbon ester, two carbon alcohol and three carbon acid. Okay, so that's your skeletal formula. Name the organic product of this reaction. So what is the name of this ester? Ethyl propanoate. 
ethyl propanoate the name of the alcohol comes in the form of the ethyl group right ethyl two carbon alcohol and then three carbon acid so that's propanoate all right next we have this v reacts with acidified manganate ions in two different ways depending on the condition V decolorizes bromine water. When the acidified manganate 7 is hot and concentrated, propanoic acid is the only organic product. The only organic product. When the acidified manganate is cold and dilute, the organic product is T, which has two chiral centers. Give the structural formula of V and T. Okay. So now, so it's a symmetric alkene, right? Yes. It has to be a symmetric alkene. Now you might say, you know what? They have said it's the only organic product, right? So we know that we have a CH group. We have a CH group, right? That, that CH group is oxidized to form the carboxylic acid. So it must be a CH2, CH3, CH2, CH, right? Three carbon acid bundle here. Now, you might say, you know what, if it was a CH2, if it was a CH2, even then propanoic acid would be the only organic product. Agreed? But why can't it be CH2? Why can't it be CH2? Anyone? If it's CH2, then it becomes only one organic product. But CH2 can't be CH2. If you look at the question. CH2 can't be CH2. बिकॉज इन्होंने क्या बोला है कि जब आप कोल्ड डाइल्यूट डालते हो कोल्ड डाइल्यूट डालते हो तो दो कायरल सेंटर बनते हैं अगर यहां पर आप कोल्ड डाइल्यूट डालते हो तो कितने कायरल सेंटर बनते हैं सिर्फ एक बनता ना अग्रीड सिर्फ एक बनता सो इट कॉन्ट बी ए सी एच टू ग्रुप इट कॉन्ट बी ए सी एच टू ग्रुप सो दैट मीन इट हैज टू बी ए इट हैज टू बी ए सिमेट्रिक एल्किंग के दोनों साइडों पर आपके पास सी एच सी एच टू CH3 होगा, okay? So this will form so structural formula of V and T. V का तो हमने यहीं पर लिख दिया, right? V was CH3, CH2, CH double bond CH, CH2, CH3, six carbon alkene. And what about T? T में हम लोग ने क्या करा? बस दोनों में डायोल बना दी, right? CH2 CH OH, I'll use a different color for the OH, and then again CH OH, and CH two CH three. Identify the types of stereoisomerism shown by V and T. What type does V show? What type of stereoisomerism does V show? V is an alkene, right? It shows geometric or cis-trans isomerism. Geometric isomerism. And what about T? They've already told us what T shows. It has two chiral centers. So then it shows optical isomerism. Good. T shows optical isomerism. 